I listen to those words. Our God is powerful. And I'm reminded why every one of you wants to be here this morning. Because we live in a world where our God or the God of this world is made very small in the likeness of us. And to come to a place today and hear of a great big God that is all powerful that we can turn to. So thank you, church. Thanks for singing it out. Thanks for engaging in that. Thanks for coming here hungry and expecting, going, I want that God. Last week, we spent a whole bunch of time on one little phrase that is a key phrase here at Calvary. We talk about it all the time. We talk about prayer, something only God can do. You'll see it everywhere throughout our building. Uh, most of you who heard last week got one of these um, black armbands that says something only God can do. If you didn't get one of these, here's why we're handing these out. We want this every day as you read this to remind you there are things in this world that only God can do, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to seek him for it, and by wearing this, I'm going to just continue to be reminded that there are things in my life that all the work I can do and all the trying and all the hoping I can do, I'm not going to get there, but I'm going to just seek a great big God, say, God, you do it, you do it, and pray over and over, God, would you do something only you can do in this area? And we've talked about it last week, about a number of areas in our lives that we can pray for that just come to our mind immediately, things that maybe years ago we we stop praying for, and we're now going, no, I'm, go I'm going to lean in on that, and I'm going to continue to pray for that. I'm going to keep on seeking God on that. And so we ask you to go onto our church website or onto the church app and to uh, press the prayer button. It's right there in the top of our website, and to put in that prayer request, to put in that something only God can do, and let us pray with you on that. There's also a place on there where you can write your story of how God answered that and how God God's moving in your life along that line. We realize these things don't always take place overnight. Many of these things have been developing for many years, but um, come Thanksgiving time, we're going to have an opportunity to have a um, discussion on that and have you be able to share some of the testimonies of what God's doing. This week, I had a really cool opportunity to talk to a whole bunch of people who shared with me there's something only God can do prayer requests. I mean, it just seemed like everyone I came into contact with was saying, oh, by the way, let me tell you what, what I'm praying for, and thanks for reminding me of this because I just want this to be front and center. And so we've started praying for a lot of those things. One of the categories, and I mention it because it came up in, I don't even know how many conversations, but it was like the majority of the conversations, it was, it was not something I get an opportunity to talk with people about a whole lot, and it was the subject of addiction. And a lot of people talked about um, different addictions that they have, and that that was one of those things that they hadn't been able to get beyond and push through, and they'd tried all sorts of different things, and that for them, just saying, God, I'm going to pray for something only you can do in this area was a powerful thing. And in the midst of a number of those conversations, something came out, and, and it was just really, they, they said, I, I struggle to talk about this. This is something I've never talked about, because I just feel so, and, and they try to explain their feeling. And I was thinking about this morning's topic and passage. We're in Romans chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, would love to turn to, have you turn there with me. We're a people of the book, and so we follow along in the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there are always Bibles in the back. They're always free. Um, grab one. Make it your own. If you know someone that doesn't have a Bible, grab it for them and take it to them. It's our gift to you. We're a generous church, and we want to just continue sharing wherever we can. And um, that's one of the ways in which we share as a church. But at the beginning of Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the Apostle Paul started out by saying, um, as, as a result of this, and I'll talk about what it's a result of here in a second, but he says, therefore, there's now no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. And I recognize what some of these folks were trying to explain to me this week was that they were feeling condemnation on their life because of um, this issue that they were dealing with in their life. And even, even as they started to pray for something only God could do, they felt sort of a freedom from that, that condemnation. And condemnation is one of those things that just constantly makes you feel bad, makes you feel like you're not good enough and that you haven't accomplished enough and that people are looking at you in a very dark way. And for a lot of people, that ultimately leads to the comment like, it's not worth living anymore. I, I'm, I'm never going to overcome this. I'm not ever going to get through this situation. This situation is never going to get better. I just would do better being dead is the ultimate conversation that comes out of that. And probably a lot of you have said that and probably even more of you have heard that said to you. 
that's condemnation. And the Apostle Paul wants us to know, as he writes chapter 8 of Romans, that is never from God. God is not in the business of condemning. This chapter wraps up a whole section where he's explaining to us, we got to put our faith, we got to put our trust in Jesus Christ. And when you do, we get to this. That's why he says, therefore, there's now no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Now, there, there is a different C word that once you're in Jesus Christ happens. It's the word conviction. And conviction is 180 degrees different than condemnation. And a lot of times people don't know the difference between the two. There's a huge difference between the two. When you put your trust in Jesus, Holy Spirit came into your life. And now you have God residing in you. And God is speaking to you because he loves you. And I like to explain it this way. It's like I've explained to the kids as they've gotten their license and gotten their own cars and this kind of stuff. When that red light lights up on your dashboard, what should you do right away? I guess no one's ever talked to you about it either. Um, <laughs> if, it's, if a red light comes onto your dashboard today, stop. Just stop. Get off the road. Yellow, well, you try to get a little bit further. My kids sort of learned that it's, it's like call dad right away. But um, when that red light comes on on the dashboard, there is this, this, this something is wrong. And conviction by the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit coming into your life saying, watch out, Lee, watch out, Lee, you're going down a path of sin that's not going to lead anywhere good. And our response to that is, God, forgive me, call dad. <laughs> and, and it's, Father, forgive me, I, I want to have that right. I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want to go down that wrong way. I know that's leading to all bad things. That is not condemnation. Conviction comes from God, and it's a red light to take us in the right path. Condemnation is all about leading towards death. That's why the ultimate conversation in condemnation comes down to, um, I just would do better dead. And those kinds of lies always come from Satan. And some of you have been fed those lies. He's the father of lies, and he is the father of death. And that's why we live in a, a culture where darkness is highly celebrated, where death is highly celebrated, and it's a constant theme everywhere we go because that is what Satan is a part of. When we read further down into this chapter, chapter 8, if we move down to verse 28, so I just skipped a whole bunch of verses because we've talked about a lot of them in here. It says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Okay, so, so we're not talking condemnation here. What God's in the middle of doing here, even that conviction, is working out for good. And if you read down into the next verse, you'll find out what the good is, is to make us more like Jesus. We keep on moving down to verse 30. It says, those he justified, he also glorified. It's what I talked about there a moment ago. Uh, leading up to this chapter, he's trying to get us to a place where we put our trust in Jesus. Justification, those who justified, justification is a big fancy Bible word that is a legal declaration by the God of the universe where he says, you are righteous. And he doesn't just say that to anyone. You, you, you respond to him and trust in the work that took place on Calvary that Jesus' blood was shed, and you put your trust in Jesus alone, and he gives you the righteousness of Jesus, and he legally declares you as righteous despite who you are, despite where you've been, despite what's been happening in your life. And that's why he wants you to know, listen, there's no condemnation here. I have declared you righteous. When God looks down on you, he sees you as righteous. And then he says, those who he declared righteous, those who he justified, he also glorified. Now, that's something that we're looking forward to. We still live in these sinful bodies, these mortal bodies. A lot of the results that we have in life are because sins around us, sins in our society, sins in our family, sins in our own lives, and, and it's constantly beating us up. But we look forward to the day when sin is ultimately and finally removed from us in the eternal state. And what he wants to say here is that God actually sees us not only as 
justified, but he already sees us as if we are glorified. We're still wrestling through that. The day is coming when we're going to be in the eternal state where we're going to be glorified. But when God looks at us now, he looks at us as a done deal. He looks at us as if we're already there. And I pumped about that because that means that God's decision to save us is settled. It's not one of those things that is moving back and forth. One of the questions that we find ourselves jumping into oftentimes in conversations is, is there something that I can do where if I step across this line, I've gone one step too far, and even though God declared me righteous at one time, it's over, it's done. I'm never going to get to that glorified peace. And this chapter, chapter 8, is one that is going to come back to you as comfort and encouragement and say, God loves you so much. So what Paul does in the rest of this passage is he throws up five quick questions. And I'm not going to be long today. I'm just going to go through these five quick questions. And um, so, so if, if you're um, in your Bible, if you look in verse 31, about halfway through the verse, I wrote the first question there. I just sort of put a one before it. It's, um, so it starts out with says, what then shall we say to these things? You know, if we, we've been justified, made righteous, and God already sees us as glorified even though we're not there yet, the Apostle Paul says, what do we say to this? Right there in the middle of the verse, I put a number one because this is the first question of five. If God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer will be no one. You and I recognize, oh, plenty of people will come against us. Ultimately, there's, there, Satan hates us and he's coming against us. Can he win? No. Does he have a play? No, not for the child of God who has the righteousness of Jesus placed on him. The next one, verse 32, I put a little two next to this because it's the second question. There's just five real quick in a row here. He who did not spare his own son but gave him, talk about the generous God, gave him for us all. How will we not also with him graciously give all things? God loves us so much. He got high, high price, gives, gives, gives to us. And we look at that and we say, how in the world, his question mark is, how in the world, if, if he's done all of that for us, how will he not continue to graciously give us all things? He's not in the business of giving it and taking it back. He's not in the process of giving it and this is a trick and um, it, it really didn't exist. And so I, I think it's been a bunch of years now. Some of you know in October they have this nationwide thing, you know, that they've labeled Clergy Appreciation Month. In the town that I was living in at that time, uh, they brought all the pastors together and had a banquet for us for um, Pastor Appreciation Month. So we all arrive at this banquet, and it was a, this beautiful conference center. We walk in there. It was really nice. As we walk into the lobby of the place, um, there is this brand new car from a local dealership sitting there. One person, a sign on it says, one person will win this today. Has the whole big bow on the top of it. And, and you're looking at this and all of a sudden my mind starts going, I'm looking around to see how many pastors have been invited to, to this event. It's a pretty small town. So there's only a, a, a finite number of pastors invited to this event. And I'm thinking to myself, this is pretty cool. I, I could win this day. And it said, um, win free three-year lease on this vehicle. It's beautiful, shiny. I can still picture it sitting there. And I'm just like, oh, yes. I think my chances are pretty good. So you go in there and they're talking it up the whole time. They keep on bringing it up and they keep on talking about one of you is going to drive away here, from here today in it and you're going to have a free three-year lease on this thing. And I'm, I'm just, I don't know, I, you know how it does to you. It just messes with your head and you just wish and somehow think that you could win it and this kind of thing. And so anyhow, we finally get to that place in the program where they say, okay, now it's the time to um, um, give away the car. And they said, um, so here, here's the deal. Um, right now, if you um, are sitting down, I'd um, like you to take the placemat that um, is in front of you. If you turn it over, you'll find um, someone has a key underneath that placemat. And I turned over my placemat, and there was the key. I looked at this key. It was the key to the car. And I'm, I have to tell you what, for as much as I'd been hoping, 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 hoping I'd win it, it was one of those weird moments. I just turned bright red, broke out in hot sweat. I'm just sitting there thinking, 
this is not right. I mean, it was weird. I mean, I was dying for it moments before. All of a sudden, at this moment, I'm like, wow, oh, there's a lot of people that need a car a lot more than I do in here. This is terrible, and I feel embarrassed right now. And, and they're like, take the key, take the key. And I took the key, and they said, all right, go over to the car, which was now like in this back corner of the room. Go over to the car and open up your brand new car. I go over to that car. I stick the key into the thing, and I turn it, and nothing happens. And that's what everyone did, started laughing. And I'm there like, they're like, you can't get in, you can't get in. And they're like, I guess it's not your car. I'm like, huh. <laughs> you mean I thought I won and you pulled it back to me? They did this two more times. The next thing he's like, look under your chair. And everyone's underneath their chair pulling off a key. The next person goes out and finally someone wins this car. I think when he reads this here, he says, God is being generous to us. God has given us his son. Isn't it funny how we think of winning a car or winning, you know, that that big, huge prize? But when he says, God, when he sent his son to this earth to do something that we couldn't do for ourselves, this incredible generosity, I think, I I don't know about, I struggle to quantify how big that is. I deserve death. I deserve hell. I deserve nothing good. We live in a world where we're told you deserve everything good. You are amazing. You're wonderful. And I recognize, no, I'm not. I'm a sinner. And outside of a God who stepped out of heaven, loving, loving, loving me so much that he would give his son Jesus, I would be desperately lost. And he says, by the way, if he'll do that for me, won't he do all sorts of other amazing things We started out going, what a great God. Can we come in here and trust in a big God? If there's a theme that's going through my mind here recently is, Lee, take your God from being this big. Take your God from being this big and make him bigger and bigger every day. Because he is that big and he is that powerful. When I picture him this big, when I picture him as one who can just be sort of like I can pop a couple quarters in the God vending machine, press the button and get what I want and then go on and um, come back later when I want something else, put a couple more quarters in there, press the button, pull it out. When that's all the bigger my God is, I live this very anemic Christianity when all of a sudden he starts becoming bigger and bigger and I realize that where he fits into my life, that, that he is my everything and he, he, is, he is large in my life, all of a sudden I can depend upon him, I can lean into him, and I can recognize that every last thing in my life has to do with something only God can do. The third question here, in verse 33 says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? And he clarifies coming out of that, it's God who justifies. Now, if God who justifies, remember, that's the one who creates this legal declaration that you're his child, this legal declaration that you are righteous with Jesus' righteousness. He says, no, no one can overcome that. A big, big God, it's God who justifies. And if you continue down to the, the fourth question, We're in the middle of verse 34. I put a number four here. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. Now, what that did there was sort of took us behind the veil. We don't get very many opportunities to have a sneak peek into the throne room of heaven. But in this moment, it's as if we're able to peek behind the curtain and see Jesus. And Jesus is there at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding on our behalf. There is another place in Scripture where there is an even more vivid picture of this painted. It's with real names and real situations. If you want to turn there, you're welcome to. Uh, It's a book you haven't gone to for a while. Zechariah chapter 3. Now, if you're not sure where to start, the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. Zechariah is just before Malachi. 
So if you want to turn there, you can. If you're just taking notes, you might want to write it down. But this is fascinating because I think oftentimes we wonder, what's heaven look like? And we read all these books that people make tons of money trying to explain to us what heaven looks like. The Bible gives us some very fascinating information. Chapter 3 of Zechariah, verse 1. It says, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest. So real name, real face, a person, Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Um, in the Old Testament, that would indicate to us a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, who was standing at his right hand to accuse him. So there is this picture of Jesus. There is this picture of Satan coming to Jesus to say, hey, let me tell you what Joshua has done. Let me tell you how bad Joshua is. Satan is still active in that kind of business. Come and say, let me tell you what Pastor Lee did. Can you believe he's a pastor of Calvary Fellowship and he did this? Can you believe he thought this? Can you imagine that was his attitude? Can you imagine? Are you kidding me? You let this guy um, lead a group of people and this is who he is? This guy here is the high priest standing before the Lord and Satan standing there to accuse him. Verse 2, and the Lord said to Satan, I love this. And you've got to remember this. Paint this picture in your head when you start being condemned, when you start being accused. Because... In fact, we'll find it in Romans 15 here in a couple months, is that the Old Testament of our Bible, these stories are told to help to train us. In fact, chapter 15 says, and to encourage us. So this, this isn't just the dark recesses of something ancient and historical. These words are written to really encourage us. So he says, um, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? And verse 3 says, Now Joshua, so that's this guy, this high priest, was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. It's a picture of his sin. The word filthy garments could very easily be described as manure-covered clothing. That's the picture that's being tried to be portrayed here. It, it's speaking of his sinfulness. It's that reminder that we had a little bit ago that none of us deserve, none of us are righteous, and we each stand before God with these manure covered, stained clothing. And um, this is a picture that God wants us to hear and see. Now, Joshua is standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments, and the angel said to those who were standing before him, This is Jesus speaking, remove the filthy garments from him. And he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. Satan on a daily basis is in the business of accusing you and condemning me. And he wants us to go down that path. And the Word of God says, for any one of you who has been declared righteous because you put your trust in Jesus, he has no ability to do so. In fact, Jesus says, he's cleaned up. I see him as righteous. The Lord rebuked Satan. Here's the fifth question. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And I think that when he writes this, when Paul writes this, you know, Paul went through an awful lot of stuff. He begins to throw out stuff that he had been through, saying, hey, could this have separated me from God? You might even uh, have your own list. Could that job loss have separated me from Christ? Uh, could, could that relational thing that was going on separate me from God? Could that um, addiction separate me from Christ? Um, could that um, loss of my uh, of a marriage separate me from Christ? Could that angry outburst that was just a part of your life at one point separate you from Christ? And he gives, a, he gives his own list here. He says, um, who shall separate me from Christ? Verse 35, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famineness, nakedness, danger 
or swords. And uh, what I love, you got underlined this verse, verse 37. He responds, no, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Because of Jesus, because of his extreme generosity, because of his love, because of something only God can do, because of a big God, we don't come in here today as a bunch of defeated people dragging in here with our shoulders down. My Bible tells me if you know Jesus as your Savior, you are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. You should... I I would love for you to walk out of here today encouraged. I would love for you to walk out of here with your shoulders back that a generous, big, huge God loves you so much that he says, you, you are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And you can't, you don't get the opportunity to say, I'm the exception. I, I, yeah, I get everyone else in here seems to be all conquery and they're all big smiles on their face, but my situation is a little bit different. You read through the New Testament of your Bible, you read through the book of Acts, you see what this guy Paul went through. If you read who he was before he became a Christian, this is why he celebrates who he is today, why he celebrates what God's doing in his life today. And he says we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And just what I want to tell you, every time Satan comes to condemn you, shut it down. Remind him that he has no place. What took place in that throne room in in Zechariah 3 with Joshua the priest is happening in the throne room with you today. And Jesus is looking, calling out your name, Joe, Ken, Kate, Mary. That's my child. I forgave them. My blood has made them righteous. There is no condemnation. They're forgiven. They're clean. It is at that moment that I believe our question is answered or stated in the last two verses of this chapter. It's really the main thing I wanted to hear for you today. I love it when you go to the restaurant and the waitress comes up and says, "Um, I'm going to give you this chef's selection for tonight. This is like really good. This is really what you want. This is fresh. This is like her like huge like specialty verses 30 and 8 and 39 of Romans 8 I want to commend them to you I want to give them to you I want you to put a star next to them I believe they're God's choice for you as a family today to encourage you so that you can go out there as conquerors in Jesus Christ he starts out these words in verse 38 Listen to these words. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up right now. He says, for I am sure. So what he's about ready to say is something that he's not just hoping is the case. He's not just thinking might be the case. He's like, this is something I'm sure of. He says, I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We wonder sometimes, is there something I can do? Is there some place I've gone? Have I stepped across the line where I've gone too far? And he says, there is nothing. The love of God, once the love of God has grabbed onto you and you've responded to it, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And he starts out and says, I am sure. A friend of mine in this church, I probably said it before, he's told me quite a while ago, he says, there's power in declaration. Declare it. So I thought, why don't we do that this morning? So I was going to ask you as we wrap up here, if, if we could declare this again, I'd like for us to shout out the words of this where we can say, I am sure, and say these words and declare it as a church. There's something that happens when we're together. It just encourages us each other. We're not alone in these things. And we know for sure 
that we're not alone when we're with God, a great big God who loves us a lot. And so we can shout, I am sure, and go into these verses. Now, what I'd love for you to do, I'd like you to jump in there with me and do that. I'd love for you to stand up right now. I'd love for us to say this together. So if you'll join me, speak these words with conviction if you have them. If you believe it right now, maybe you don't believe it right now. Maybe you need to come to that place. Circle this verse. Come back to it this week. Focus in on it. All right. You ready? Read along with me. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any in all the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you believe that? Man, live that out this week.